Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, thank you. So yeah, thanks so much for coming, everyone. My name's Carrie Fioramonti. I'm an associate professor of biology here at Gulf Coast State College. Again, I want to welcome you to another wonderful uh, seminar here, the Citizen Science Seminar Series. And tonight we have quite a treat for you. Some wonderful projects have been happening out in the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of hard work paying off in these past recent years. And I hope you don't mind, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our guests this evening. <clears throat> Chantel Weber, Weber serves as the Coastal Resource Coordinator for Bay County, Florida. She is a seventh generation Floridian and earned her degree from the University of South Florida. Her primary focus was environmental science and policy and geography with a minor in geospatial science. While living abroad in Myanmar, she also became recognized as a National Geographic educator in 2020 and continues to inspire the community to think globally, act locally. Nice. Chantel's zeal for preserving Florida's coastal beauty is unmistakable. As a scientific dive professional, she uses her familiarity with historical reefs in the northern Gulf waters to develop successful artificial reef sites in the future. She endeavors to cultivate a resilient artificial reef community in Bay County, offering enhanced opportunities for both locals and visitors to appreciate the region's marine life. After hours, Chantil enjoys kayaking and cooking. She values family time with her husband, James, along with their two beloved dogs, Remington and Rocky. Scott has been serving Northwest Florida with the University of Florida IFAS Extension since 2000. He holds the positions of Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent and Regional Specialized Agent for Artificial Reefs and Fisheries, in addition to his role as UF IFAS Extension Bay County Director. Prior to this, he accumulated 15 years of experience at Mississippi State University in the Fish Nutrition Program with Texas Parks and Wildlife in the Marine Stock Enhancement Program and at Gold Kissed Aquaculture, focusing on genetically selected and improved strains of catfish. Scott holds a master's degree in marine aquaculture from Texas A&M Corpus Christi, excuse me, Corpus Christi, and a bachelor's degree in wildlife and fisheries science from Texas A&M University. His expertise spans aquaculture, artificial reefs, recreational fisheries, coastal resiliency, and coastal ecosystems restoration. Scott resides in Lynn Haven with his wife, Angela, a registered nurse, and their three dogs, Jade, Ruby, and Emmy. They have two adult children, Zach and Brenna. So I meant to give the Panhandle Gator Club a minute at the beginning. I'm gonna give it to you at the end if you don't mind. Is that okay? Is that okay? Because I wanna go ahead since I have introduced our distinguished guests, the floor. So welcome, Scott and Chantil. Thank you. So I have one more dog who's famous now. <laughs> and so uh, we have a, a new husky, Nanook. And so uh, we've got four dogs. There's never, um, I haven't met a dog I didn't like. How's that? I'm a little concerned that <laughs> your dogs are listed before your kids. Yeah. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> Anyway, we're, we're glad to be with you tonight, and uh, thank you, Carrie, for uh, that welcome, and also thank you to the Gator Club for uh, sponsoring us tonight. And we're, we're happy to share what's been going on in Bay County. Um, Chantilly and I are excited to be here, mm -hmm. and um, we'll, we'll both be sharing with you uh, some general information about artificial reefs in the state of Florida, and then also specific here in uh, in Panama City and in Bay County also. We're gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the benefits that we see from artificial reefs and why we would put down artificial reefs and consider those. We'll also talk to you um, openly about some of the issues that artificial reefs have that we need to be aware of as coastal resource managers that we address uh, daily. Uh, we'll talk to you a little bit about some of the materials and designs of artificial reefs, some of the technology and the improvements we've seen historically and then what it means as far as ecosystem restoration. And then uh, Chantil's gonna take some time to tell you what's next on the, uh, as we get through uh, 2024, it's, a, it's gonna be an exciting year. And then last, last but not least, we're gonna tell you a little bit about how you can 
help us with our, our artificial reef program and our marine science program here in, in, uh, in our, our county. And so before we begin, I do want to say thank you to everyone who's shown up today. You're the reason why we're able to have a successful artificial reef program. If you've got questions, Scott and I have plenty of time built in towards the end. So um, if you think of something, try and write it down. Um, and we might be able to take questions intermittently, but otherwise we hope you enjoy. Okay, so what are artificial reefs? And so most of us that live in Bay County understand what artificial reefs are because they're a part of our daily lives, especially if you're on the water. Uh, given the amount of just unconsolidated bottom that we have, sand and mud and those types of things, artificial reefs really provide an opportunity for us to put down hard substrate, uh, things like concrete, some of the materials of opportunity or what we call secondary use materials. They didn't start out as artificial reefs like, like our, our boats that you probably see on TV. Mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, different uh, concrete that we're gonna talk to you about that are culverts, junction boxes, and that those really are um, not really engineered for artificial reefs, but really also help us when we put them in the right uh, recipe to, to become a really good part of uh, our program and, and to be able to use both things that are uh, made specifically to be an artificial reef and things that we find as far as materials of opportunity too. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about this one? Sure. So as of a couple nights ago, we went ahead and scoured FWC's website. And as you can see, we have currently in the state of Florida, 4,007 patch reef locations. <laughs> That's quite significant. Um, at the end of 2023 last year, FWC announced that there are now over 1 million registered vessels, both commercial and recreational in the state of Florida. So this just provides ample opportunity for our fisheries, um, for our anglers, for our divers to get out and explore um, sites that have been built out specifically for our communities. And we, we've been working on our website. Chantel has been really hard at work to pull all that together. About how many artificial reefs do we have in Bay County now? Well, from the last update, there yeah. were about 250, and we're up to nearly 800 in Bay County now, which is very significant. So we'll be sharing you where you get all those numbers, and they're in all different kinds of things, so stay tuned for that. There's some ways that you can take care of that. Um, so some of the first artificial reefs what do you think they were? What are, what are some ideas of where the, some of the ideas of some of the first artificial reefs? I thought, do you have your hand up? Sunken, Sunken ships. ships, really good. Anything else? Any other objects maybe from the 80s or the 70s that you can remember <laughs> going down? Tires. Tires are a big one. Yeah. East Coast. Yeah, off the East Coast, um, white goods, so anything like refrigerators, um, ovens, toilets. Which automobiles. Really automobiles were big. Walter Buses, Marine constantly shares that. Box cars. cars. Yeah. So. And um, even at one time, you know, porcelain toilets. So um, what we've seen is a progression to become more uh, thoughtful in what we put down mm -hmm. and move away from anything goes type kind of thing. But something that would be uh, what we call uh, both, you know, I would say stable so it doesn't move, and then durable. You know, we're looking for something at least 10 years, mm -hmm. um, if not longer. Some of the concrete projects and some of the things we're looking at are, are decades, predicted to be decades long. Mm -hmm. And so we are monitoring those um, materials, and we'll talk more about monitoring later on in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, we used to take, uh, I guess I should go back a little ways. One of the things that really progressed from the initial shipwrecks were the log huts that were built off of South Carolina in the late 1800s. And so as you can imagine, wood did not last very long. So, but it did allow for the colonization and became you know, hard substrate and provided, a, a, I guess, the, the first little uh, pioneer artificial reefs that we had on purpose um, in the United States. So it's really kind of interesting to think about how we've progressed from log huts, probably like, you know, houses or whatever else, uh, from fish, you know, the fish houses have gotten better. And you can see this picture uh, behind me uh, where they're actually using explosives to um, 
help with the deployment, deployment and getting the sh ship down and actually have it, have it sink. Uh, when that vessel does that, it usually ends up in a bunch of pieces and it doesn't last as long. And so we don't usually use explosives any longer. The last one that I can think of was the Ariscany. Mm -hmm. And so that was a 900 foot aircraft carrier, which required some, uh, a lot of help and it'll show up later on in the show. But it's nice to see the technology from the time that I've been involved with the artificial reef programs in Northwest Florida, uh, which I started in August of 2000, where they've just come so far with technology like GPS antennas on the end of the crane so they can pinpoint and put things exactly where they want, want them to be. And we've got some good examples of just how technology has helped. Side scan sonar, where it used to be that we would you know, we would have to get some help from the military or something like that or, or uh, you know, a, another institution or, or work with a, a researcher. Now these are all consumer items that we can use with volunteers and also use professionally for us too in a, in a different kind of way. Well, and more interestingly too, for those of you who are engineers or, or have done survey work, some of our marine contractors are starting to lean into the Trimble technology to do position fixing for our reef sites which makes it very integrative, so you're not having to go out and, let's say, buy equipment specific. Anyways. But we, we, we see this in all types of aspects, and that's, GPS is just one, one part of that. Yes, Skip? You gotta admit, the dynamite sure was fun. It was, I, ha I have, we do have to admit that, that that was a, a part of the spectacle, but I still get excited when I see an artificial reef go down or a, a vessel go down, and we got some good pictures that we, we got later on. Um, I, I guess one of the questions we get a, a lot is, why does it take so long to, to do an artificial reef? And this slide says why. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it takes a lot of preparation and a lot of planning to get things done. And you really have to identify where the funding sources are gonna come from. We never have enough money. Um, much like any other projects, uh, and, and we are we are working to to do that constantly. Um, we always try to work on you know a good targeted location based on what we want to do for the reef, what the objectives are for that reef, um, as it uh, relates to the users, as it relates to uh, benefiting the environment, and so those are things that we all have to, to go into that. Once we have those things in place, then we can go to, to the permitting. And the permitting involves both um, permits from the state level, at, from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Those usually come first, and then we end up with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, working with them on some of their uh, standard permits for offshore to give us the uh, ability to put the, the reefs in the areas that we have chosen. Um, those can take a couple of years to, we have had one case depending on whether we have to do cult, a coastal resources survey or a cultural resources survey. Those can take, you know, uh, several years past, past five years, you know, four or five years. So that's why some of these things take longer than others. At the same time, we can advance uh, other parts of the timeline and that's what we do a lot of times. It's not just wait on permitting, but we're doing the other things that we can do at the time. Uh, if the materials haven't been made, they have to be manufactured if they're going to be engineered. Uh, we also have to secure secondary use materials or uh, materials uh, like the vessels we were talking about. And then we also have to, um, you know, come up with a plan of what we're going to do as far as develop or deploying those resources and being so sure that we don't have anything go awry or sink in boat traffic or in the pass or anything like that. So that we have to have, sometimes we have to have extra insurance. Sometimes we have to have extra precaution to make sure that we have chosen properly and we've, we've done everything that we need to do. And then uh, eventually the day that we really like is uh, deployment day. And uh, that's the one that you usually see on television. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a great day. And then um, the other thing is it's not over then, you know, I, after that, you go back and you continue to monitor those projects, both from the what's underneath the water and how well it's doing uh, from a productive standpoint for uh, benefiting the environment, and then also 
what's going on on top of the water. How much boat traffic are we getting? How many people are actually accessing this reef and how many people are actually utilizing that? We do this sometimes on uh, one reef and look at both top and bottom, or sometimes we just look at different uh, aspects of, of individual reefs. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth noting too, for those that are newer in the field or have an interest in marine biology, marine science, a uh, massive part of how we select these locations go into stakeholder engagement. We've got one of the largest charter communities in the state of Florida, the Panhandle, bar none, um, has some of the largest fleets in the state. Um, that goes for our dive shops as well. They're more active than most. And so a lot of times we'll bring them into the office and ask where are you finding the best catch? Where are you having um, the best visibility when it comes to putting material down? We don't want to send divers down where the current is causing a lot of turbidity. So that's just something to tuck away in the back of your minds when we're going through the permitting and the deployment process. So on the bottom is one of the voodoo jets that's kind of illustrating that whole process. Uh, one of those jets actually sat out front just around the corner here before Highway 98 was um, built and that when that um, highway came through that jet was taken down and actually some of the people from Tyndall and the Tyndall Dive Club helped to process that jet so it's kind of cool that they could bring the mechanics and help to prepare re by removing the wiring and all the different types of pieces that we had to get out of that jet. Uh, the middle picture is actually when we loaded it on the uh, low boy and moved it over to the staging area and then this other picture is uh, taken about five years later before Hurricane Michael and um, we'll talk a little bit more about what the impact of hurricanes but if I remember right we're coming up on the one of our videos with uh, with this with uh, monitoring jets. you want to tell me a little bit about this video sure so following Hurricane Michael like Scott said the, the picture on the right hand side of the screen was pristine the voodoo jets had been deployed parallel to one another upright um, about 12 miles or so southwest from the pass and our SARS C site, uh, which is small area artificial reef site C. And so part of us, Bay County's artificial reef program acquiring these materials, they're considered surplus from the military. That means we have to do annual reporting to let our government know the condition of these materials and how well they're holding up under the current. So. Um, in 2021, FWC biologists had reported that one of the jets had just slid about 50 feet east. They were both up, or one had uh, landed overturned. So one was upright and the other was overturned. And so two years later, although Michael happened in 2018, I dove this last August, and that same jet that was 50 feet east had moved 50 feet and then shifted an extra 115 feet west. And so Depending on the time of year, conditions can be very turbid. And what that meant for us on the survey dive was that going down with FWC biologists, we ran a transect line, so underwater, it's just long measuring tape. And we <laughs> basically started at the overturned jet that we knew was far out, and we went ahead and swam and uh, extended the tape out to the point so we could measure exactly to 115 feet. So where our overturn jet is, you'll see in the video, there are two tetrahedrons about eight feet tall, which are normal. They come from Walter Marine. That's typically what's deployed. And we'll get more into that when we talk about NERDA. So just some fascinating footage. I can kind of share some back end now that it's been submitted. And this is the video went to uh, our government. Oh, uh, just a minute. Let me go ahead and share this. I don't think it's. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Just a second. No, I think so. we're, we'll move it over. I think is what we're going to do. There's the, oh, it's extended screen. Okay. So hit escape, and I think you can do it. Let's see if I can. I did that. That's oh. how we got to there. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I have to, I've got to get to that screen. I don't know how, there we go. Escape. Now 
we may not be able to get back to the PowerPoint. But. So you can tell me a little bit about what's Good question. On this, on this site, there really weren't any. Uh, a lot of amberjack, a lot of small, small bait fish. A lot of tomcates, you'll see. They've got different colored stripes along their body, nice round eyes. Um, a few different species of damselfish, you'll see. Some blennies, they're the little small fish that like to hide and poke their head out. But this is uh, about 90 feet. So 85 to 90 feet, kind of depending on where you're at in SARS Sea. Both of the jets that were right at about 90 feet or so at sand bottom. So th this is almost at ground zero where Hurricane Michael hit. So these are some of the impacts that we've learned, you know, and, and it's obvious. And it wasn't just the jets that got tore up. It was some of our larger uh, reefs that we'll share with you in just a minute. Um, some of them weigh close to 40 tons. So I, so I should say 20 tons, 36,000 pounds. And you'll see I've got, I've got different annotations in the video because from the hurricane, just from storms in general, it doesn't have to be hurricane strength. The nose cone is broken off a lot of times. Um, folks that go out that want to fish on these sites, and I'll use the word irresponsible, are irresponsible of the way that they anchor. So if an anchor drops, hard enough onto our material, it'll break something off and that's irreversible. We can add other materials to serve as a buffer or a barrier to try and keep it in place. And so that's why you'll see here the concrete cubes, the pipes, it's to kind of keep everything in a tight space. Trigger fish, always. always. So one of the lessons learned, of course, is, you know, we, we would um, welcome to, to be able to do um, aircraft in the future, but we probably would go in a lot deeper water. Um, and you know, work on some uh, opportunities to protect those reefs for a little bit longer period of time, given the fact that we have a lot of hurricanes in the area. And we are conscientious about it. We have stability analysis software now that FWC has provided. We've got some of our bigger partners down in Miami-Dade who use it regularly for their deployments. And so bridging the gaps maybe in the science and the communication really helps us to have more contiguous artificial reef plans and programs in place. All right, let me move over and see if I can get back to where the PowerPoint is. So you can see that work is very boring. I would say do another material. Aluminum just doesn't hold up. Um, the, the most contentious point with the state and then the federal level is putting materials down that have short-term value. Um, so 10 years, I, I would really overlook that personally. I want something that's gonna give me a 50-year lifespan, 100-year lifespan plus. So that's why steel ships are favorable. Um, wood is no longer used because it floats, it splinters, it could hurt somebody. If, uh, if you're a wreck diver and you're doing penetrative and it snags on your wetsuit, so the, that material's been ruled out. So reefs are really put down, you know, uh, for the uh, benefit of humans as they try to benefit the ecology that are nearby. And so in our area, uh, we estimate there's close to 2,000 jobs related to Bay County's artificial reefs. Uh, that's come from a 2015 study by UWF with Dr. Huth. Um, about half of those are related to fishing, about half of them are related to diving. We, we rank in the top 10 as far as dive lo uh, destinations in the state of Florida. We also rank, I think, second as a tourist destination in Northwest Florida. If you're coming to this area by car, you're either gonna go to Orlando and go visit the theme parks, or you're gonna come uh, here to visit us and visit our, our beaches and our, our coastal economy with our artificial reefs. So it's really important um, that we um, try to help our industries that are here, our people that are here that are making money off of that because everything trickles down from the people that come to, to dive here, to, to fish here. They stay in our hotels, they buy bait, um, they uh, have a meal, and that's just the beginning of, of what people do on vacation. Uh, and so what a unique opportunity, what a neat, unique place. And you know, even coming over tonight, I'm thinking, I'm surrounded by water, this is really cool. You know, and sometimes we forget how much we depend on those types of opportunities for our area. 
I'll let Chantil talk <laughs> about this guy. For those of you who've uh, had an eye on the news lately, massive endeavor between our counties. It's the first of its kind. Um, when I first started here in Bay County and moved up from Tampa Bay, one of the things that I wanted to do was establish a more cohesive relationship across the panhandle because the Scambia had kind of really put their name on the map with the Oriskany. I mean, besides the Vandenberg and some of the other larger vessels down in South Florida, we hadn't seen anything like that up here. And so I said, well, how can we as Bay County leverage more funding for our program? Because just by and far, our economy is a lot different than Escambia, Okaloosa, and Walton. And that came about in the form of a tri-county project, which I've been told is a historical feat. We're very proud of this. We just deployed the RV research vessel, Deep Sim 3, um, on January 30th. It's a 239-foot vessel uh, used in seismic research and oil exploration, which is pretty fascinating. It's got a beautiful deck area. As you can see on the back, I took this video with my camera. Uh, there's about 30 layer cake modules on there, so really good interstitial space for your lobsters, um, for any of your other arthropods, smaller fishes to hide in. So I'll go ahead and share that with you really quick. It was exciting, and it took, I think, about 45 seconds to go down. 45 minutes. And it landed straight up. Yeah, it's a 45-minute uh, total. This video didn't take that long. This is sitting at uh, about 130 feet at, at San Bonham. The, the wheelhouse is accessible to advanced divers at about 65 feet. And it was it was really cool to watch because that's one of the few that I've actually seen just kind of she just eased into the water and just went down with without any problem and really looks really nice on the bottom right now with the uh, pictures that we got back. Yeah. Were the concrete modules held in place or just one fell off? One out they, of thirty. But uh, they were they were tacked down so that they should not have. Um, move so one of them did move but it's not a problem because it, it yes mm -hmm. it is it's just oh, a sideways one and more interestingly too if you're a diver we sent one of our tech divers down kelly Kawa, who owns big blue dive boat he said that if if you're uh, capable of making it down to 130 feet the bow thruster hole is open they've removed um, any of the heavier material from it so you can swim right through and that's just until the the currents push it along with our longshore currents. So if you're adventurous, you can still swim through the front of the vessel at the bottom. It's about 30 nautical miles to the uh, west. And so it's, um, you know, right, right as you come off of our, um, it's in Lars B? Uh, it's in Okaloosa's Lars A. Lars A, okay. Um, so we talked a little bit about this and kind of referred to this over time. Um, you know, as we put down artificial reefs, we're actually initiating um, the marine ecology, just the way it responds to that uh, hard structure going into the water. And so it takes about three to five years for it, fully, for it to fully develop. Uh, you'll see some encrusting organisms at first, uh, some of the barnacles. You may see a stray barracuda come through or um, the other day, we were close enough when the, what the divers reported were lionfish almost immediately mm -hmm. because there was a reef nearby. So it doesn't take long for uh, them to start, you know, fish to start to use those spaces for um, hiding from predators or to be, if they are a predator, to use it for ambushing bait fish as they start to accumulate. And um, one of the advantages to artificial reefs is that it can actually reduce some of the pressure on um, our natural reef systems. And so um, it provides a, a place for uh, all this life to accumulate and also makes it an interesting spot to either uh, go fishing or go diving and go spear fishing. So um, we know that there is going to be an increased amount of mortality uh, from fishing on these reefs when we put them down. And so our job is to put down a variety of artificial reefs that um, also serve to um, support the species as they develop. 
And so we look more to the future and part of our technology to bridge the gap between the estuaries and the fish migrating out to the reefs and helping them through the whole life stages. And those would be ones that we probably wouldn't fish because the fish wouldn't be big enough and uh, the materials would be slightly different. So there's some strategies that we all are trying to, to learn and trying to apply. There's a lot of um, research information. We titled this as Reefs in the Real World. Um, and one of the reasons we, we say that is because we have a lot of science and a lot of information that was uh, developed over the years, not just by uh, Dr. Lindbergh, who's pictured here. He was our, uh, one of our pioneers in artificial reef research um, with some of the work that he did outside of Taylor County with um, uh, Gag Grouper. And uh, the next picture will show you some of his reef modules, which are standard, um, so that he could actually uh, start to tease out some of the things and the benefits of, of artificial reefs and some of the things that we needed to be aware about. Um, how many of you have ever heard of the attraction versus production argument? So I see a few hands. Um, and if I ask you, about half of you would say artificial reefs make fish and the other half would say no, they attract fish, and you would both be right, okay? So what we have found is sometimes we, we phrase things as, you know, in science as ones or zeros, yes or no, or, you know, this theory is, and then you can't, you know, it's really weird when you come back and you get two different answers from the same question. And it really depends on the situation. In the real world, reefs can act either way. And so we have to be cognizant of what the user groups are, the amount of fishing pressure that's going to be on these sites, how productive the materials are. Um, fishing pressure can also be related to their uh, proximity to shore, to people that would be interested in that. So there's a lot of different factors and we can't just say they, they attract and we can't just say that they um, are producing fish either. It's both. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't make it easy to tr try to figure out reefs in the real world sometimes, but you just have to kind of keep that in mind as you start to design projects and know what's going on. And that's part of why we have monitoring. Well, and then part of that, too, is um, I'll add, we'll go over the Restore project here shortly in NERDA, but I had mentioned that we work with our stakeholders regularly, and our charter captains are great because they'll say, well, I know that I've got a set of reefs here that produce amberjack regularly, right? They're attracted to the cert material, but maybe 100 feet or half a mile away, we're not finding those same populations. So Scott and I can work with them to kind of study an area um, and we'll, we'll deploy reefs publicly and say is this going to help enhance recruitment? Is this going to benefit your fisheries from a commercial aspect? And so a lot of trial and error, but um, their feedback is, is crucial and critical for helping us move our pro uh, program yeah, along. I, I think about my time with all these fish ponds, you know, in my early career and we would have, you know, hundreds of ponds and they would all be different. Think about the Gulf of Mexico, every part is, is different and the variability is really difficult to try to tease out any strict things. But that's what, that's what Dr. Lindbergh would, would try to do. I appreciate what he did and what other uh, researchers have done over time, which is try to help us work systematically uh, using scientific methods to give us answers one baby step at a time and lead to the next study and to the next study. These Lindbergh cubes are actually standardized cubes that they put off uh, in the areas. They have one hole inside of them. So they don't look like any of our necessary reefs that we have engineered for concrete. They were actually made for studies and those types of things. Um, just to just know that um, we, we know too that reefs are not the be all end all type kind of situation. We really value our natural habitat. One of the things that we um, are always aware of is where is our natural hard bottom and where is these areas so that we can uh, not interfere with those types of dynamics that are happening there. The spacing of artificial reefs was one of the things that we learned right away. Um, that was one of the, the studies that was done. There's a forage area outside of there for some of the species and if you get them too close together they start to interfere with each other 
and the amount of food sources are not there. So we try to space our reefs out about 800 feet apart. When you get a permit though that is prescribed, it's really hard to figure out reefs in the real world, where to, where to do the spacing application of those types of studies. So, And then sometimes too it's hard to account for your hard bottom habitat because then we have ephemeral reef spaces where we might do a survey one week prior to a storm event and it's just sand bottom and then following a storm we might have hard bottom exposed and then that forces us to resurvey until we can find an area or move 200 feet, which is written into the permit language, move about 200 feet off in any direction within the permitted boundaries to try and deploy some material. And we, when we do, do a deployment, we're always looking for uh, marine life that might be out, sea turtles, um, any number of things that we could uh, observe at that point. We're also uh, redoing our surveys, you know, to see if um, we see a condition like you're talking about. Sure, so um, some of the larger reef issues that we'd like to touch on are specifically related to invasive species, two of which you can see are the lionfish and the regal damselfish. Um, the regal damselfish, I'm sure Skip is familiar with um, being in the aquarium business. A lot of owners, um, aquarists, release them out into the northern gulf and that's not where they're endemic so it's an introduced species um, we're starting to see that if you go out and onto st andrew's jetties just snorkeling you'll see them tucked in the rock spaces so this is not their nat natural habitat um, we're more temperate subtropical and they're by and far uh, caribbean fish down in tropical waters lionfish as scott said we uh, when we deployed the deep stem there were three fish that immediately inspected the reef material the steel it's shiny it's going to attract anything three lionfish so that's our biggest problem is we've not yet come up with a surefire way to do elimination a lot of that comes into education so if we are able to send divers down um, i know zookeeper came to our workshop last week and has said if you know you can put a Hawaiian sling in someone's hand, we'll try and get them taken out as quickly as possible. And it's it's a feat. It's a feat. These fish kind of come out of nowhere. Um, when I was doing the voodoo surveys with FWC last year, the smallest lionfish I've ever seen was two inches. But we made a point to eradicate it because we don't want that spawning in the future. So um, there are some estuarine studies we can share if anyone's interested um, about their spawning habits up in the bay system. But beyond that, if Scott has anything. Uh, I was just going to say that we, we did complete our uh, Northwest Florida lionfish workshop last week with a gathering of experts, and we just chopped up that video into uh, digestible sizes that you can watch and learn more about our updates on artificial reefs and lionfish interactions. Uh, we have that um, on a website, or actually on a Facebook page, called Florida's Artificial Reefs, and uh, we'll share that more uh, later on today. And this one is uh, bear trauma. This is what happens when fish are uh, down below the surface and they rapidly ascend. Uh, the gases inside of their swim bladder come out and they can actually push out um, some of the internal organs. That is not the swim bladder coming out of that fish's mouth and should not be poked. That is actually the stomach. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually demonstrating where you would actually mm -hmm. put in the um, needle. It's almost like letting out the air of a football or a basketball. Um, there are also these new uh, return to depth devices. Um, we have uh, one, that I should have brought the black tip with us, it's in my office and it, it's just a weight with a, uh, a little uh, stopper on it. When, it. when the weight hits the bottom, the fish has uh, got his uh, mouth and the lip right here. Let me see if I can get there in this area, so right here. And so when the uh, release mechanism hits the bottom, the swoop, fish uh, swims off and has been returned to depth and repressurizes them uh, mm -hmm. to do that. There's another one that's automatic. Uh, the brand, brand name is Sequelizer. And so there are other products on the market probably, I'm sure, that, that do the same thing. When it gets to a certain depth that's been predetermined, you can turn it um, and it'll go uh, automatically and do the same thing that this does. So it doesn't have to go all the way to the bottom uh, per se. Yes, sir. Uh, 
actually, uh, fish and mortality could be that, or it could be I take it home and I eat it. Or it could be bycatch. Yeah, or, or un unintended um, consequences. And we would consider this bycatch. If this fish is not of the right size limit, uh, not the right species, we're out of season or something like that, then pulling these fish up and, and subjecting them to, to barotrauma trauma could be one of the uh, things. But when we generally talk about fishing mortality, we're talking about anything related to fishing where we could, um, it could be, this fish is prized, I'm taking it home to eat, you know, type kind of thing. It's just part of the end life stage that we manage uh, fisheries for and those types of things. There is a, a unintended, uh, I guess, catch where, where we, we have caught them out of season or we've caught something that we cannot legally keep, mm -hmm. that uh, then raises the issue of them going through this um, process. That answer the question. I think so. I, I was assuming that that would be that you were referring to things that were specific to artificial reefs, but those things sound like everything. It's in fisheries management, so it's not just artificial reefs. Okay, so it's just part of um, uh, of uh, managing a fishery. Mm -hmm. We do we do work with the state and with NOAA to make sure that our fisheries are taken care of as well. So that's why it's a it's a coastal resources program. It's kind of an all encompassing approach. Um, the other thing that we have uh, that I don't have to tell many of you uh, about is hurricanes. Uh, about once every five to seven years we're looking at hurricanes that strike within our area. These are category, I believe, um, uh, these are, you know, classified hurricanes within this area that, that came through here. And I can't remember exactly how many I had uh, counted, uh, but it's quite significant that we, we have to kind of make plans for those types of things. The picture on the left is part of uh, a large uh, Walter Marine module. We'll look at some of those in a minute. We have some better pictures of those. If you were here when we were showing our pictures early at the uh, beginning of the show, one of those modules, and that's when I said it was like 38,000, 36,000 pounds, mm -hmm. flipped over on its side when the water came back out of Mexico Beach you got not only a, a rush of water, but the sand underneath of that became almost like a conveyor belt that toppled over and moved uh, all these large um, reefs. It was- Up, up uh, to about a nautical mile. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing the amount of, uh, I, I guess, uh, what, what, the, <laughs> what the ocean can do and the power, uh, how powerful water is. So in our area, we've got something called the shipwreck trail. At this point, it's, it's historical. The Oriskany starts that off in Pensacola. Um, during our artificial reef conference, there have been reviews of the Oriskany. We talked about materials that are no longer acceptable when it comes to deployment, specifically with ships. Um, most fascinatingly, because Robert Turpin, he is the Marine Resources Chief, he's been in this position for 40 years. So the man is worth his weight in salt and has a lot to offer when it comes to uh, education and deployments. They had to go through and do studies. Um, the Oriskany is now used as the foundational vessel for the EPA when we do vessel cleanup and preparation prior to deployment. And so um, because of the age of this ship, a lot of times prior to the 1980s and 1970s, we had PCBs, um, and they are carcinogenic materials. The EPA now says if you do testing, we'll, we'll scrape paint chips, um, different gaskets, submit it to a lab, and it'll come back typically within a couple weeks. Um, if there are PCBs present, they just recommend that they're painted over. And when the Oriskany was deployed, that wasn't necessarily the case. They said that um, the materials should just basically, the, the carcinogen should basically dissipate over time, and that wasn't necessarily the case. We found that um, bioaccumulation was a problem. The fish that had made the Oriskany a home um, were starting to bioaccumulate those toxins in their systems, and so the EPA had recommended to uh, Scambia County's Marine Resource Program that they do fisheries monitoring I believe it was every year or five years, mm -hmm. it was every, every year, year. Um, until they were able to reach a safe threshold where the fish was acceptable for consumption. 
And so over time, um, that information can also be shared if anyone's interested. Yeah. We had a, a great artificial reef conference last week. And that was part of the lionfish stuff. And um, we have asbestos on board that we have to mitigate, and that's painted over. PCBs are typically removed nowadays. Um, they had a special permission to remove or to leave these PCBs on board, given the threshold that they had uh, calculated with their science. And that's the, what we received the the updates on when we were there last week. Um, here are some uh, pictures too of the uh, different types of large modules that we have. They give you some, some idea of scale and size. Um, the ones on the right are the uh, way that Walter Marine used to design the um, large pyramids with the ecosystem disks built on top. Now they have found that you know after Hurricane Michael um, that actually might have been some of the reason why it uh, possibly turned over because they were top heavy. And so now they nest them and they put them inside of the vessel. The one on the left is actually made by Walter Marine, not Walter Marine, uh, but Harders. And so Harders uh, stuck their toe in the water and did these uh, a while back. And these are at the center of, of Lars A. Well, before uh, before mm -hmm. you change slides, I think mm -hmm. interestingly, if you can see on the right hand side, the texture is significantly different. When Scott was talking about attraction versus production, this is another aspect of reef management materials that we look at. What kind of uh, vertebrates or invertebrates are you trying to attract and the, the type of material used on the exterior is important as well. And these are actually made for artificial reefs. That's the, that's the main thing that we wanted to, you know, the previous slide was hey, we got an aircraft carrier, let's see what we can do with it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of our projects and I know we're running out of time. We wanna have time for question and answer too. So, um, Carrie says we're fine. So um, anyway, you wanna talk about this one or, so this is, uh, this is phase three, this is you. This is, this is ERP okay. phase three of the Narita project. And Scott will go over phase two um, after this. So ERP phase three, very exciting. Bay County was awarded $900,000 from FWC to deploy reefs. This pot of money comes directly from the BP oil spill. So it's, it's portioned out um, annually for the moment. And so exciting, this is the most amount of money that Bay County has received so far for NERDA deployments, it's exciting. The grant limits us to deploying prefabricated concrete modules, and so interestingly this year, we're able to deploy in federal waters. In the past, we were only able to deploy in state waters, which goes basically from the shoreline all the way up to about nine nautical miles, and then following that nine nautical mile threshold uh, begins federal waters. So now we're able to deploy at deeper depths to avoid, you know, as we mentioned earlier, these reefs moving. Uh, that's not what we want. We want longevity and we would, we would like them to stay in place. So with that, um, this is going to be a fisheries driven project primarily. We worked with our charter captains and have decided to do 30 of the super reef concrete modules. Walter Marine, they're based out of Orange Beach, Alabama. They've now built these 15 foot structures. So you've seen the smaller eight foot flars that the Florida artificial limestone reefs. They have 15 foot structures, and then on top of that, they have uh, an additional 10 feet of relief in the form of a yellow rebar pole that's wrapped, and it attracts amberjacks. So appropriately, we call it an amberjack reef. And we're putting 30 of those in our Lars B site. So they'll be positioned anywhere from about 12 nautical miles at the northernmost point of our Lars B site, all the way down to about 30 nautical miles south. So it spaces out pretty nicely. Um, I've got it in a checkerboard pattern and I don't have the map on here, but I, again, I, that's yeah, part sure of what we can share afterwards. Yeah, I'm not sure where that map went, but we can certainly share that. And if we run across oh. it before it's over with. <laughs> and then let me, let me not fail to mention, I think this is probably the most important part. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a teaser now. I know some of us in the community have been asking, but we are going to use the remainder of the funding from the CERTA project to put a snorkel reef in. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> So mm -hmm. during the pandemic, everybody had a, a hidden skill, you know, uh, and so I got to work on um, reefs 
uh, during 2020. And uh, December 2020, we completed this project, which uh, gave us uh, somewhere around, I want to say, uh, you know, 900 uh, tons of concrete. And these are off in state waters, off to the west as you go out toward Walton County. And so seven nautical miles as you go away from the shore, um, you will find this um, sets, of, sets of reefs uh, in this area. Uh, one of the reefs that is right here at this very edge is uh, Captain Poor's Reef. And so this is one of our 360 videos that we took. Um, Captain Charlie Poor was uh, one of our uh, people that was uh, who you would meet on the water as you left. Uh, I don't know if I can get that to work. It won't let me do it. Well, there's your there's side. <laughs> let me finish my story and then we can get to it. If I can get to it. I'll let it play. And. Um, but this is Captain Poor's Reef here. I wonder why it won't move over. All right. So in the 360 videos, you can get online and you can actually move your mouse. Or if you look at them on your phone, you can actually follow and go and you can see what divers see. It's really nice if you've got goggles on, you know, with the um, 360, you can actually experience what uh, Mike's doing right here. But uh, Captain Poor was um, um, passed away. I believe in, in, it was uh, in 2020, and he was one of the uh, folks that worked on a bait boat. And so as you came out of the pass, that was one of the first places that you stopped. And so um, the Panama City Boatmen's Association established this as a memorial reef for him. And so this is the first place you stop on the way out to our 980 tons of concrete. And um, we can play this video later on and it, hopefully it'll work a little bit better then. Looks like he's getting close, though. So. It has been deployed over um, three years. Yeah, so it's prime fishing area right now. So we'll go back to NERDA uh, 3. Somehow we got out of 2 and 3. <laughs> But this is all complementary, same types of materials. It's just going to go in different places. And this is what Chantil was talking about as far as the um, areas that are going to be deployed. There we go. So if you all can see, um, I've got Lars B labeled up here in red on the left hand side. Um, I've got it, the, the little green fish designate these 30 modules. And you can see that I've got them laid out in a checkerboard pattern. Um, the other yellow modules, that is our Mexico Beach Artificial Reef Association. Um, they've got a lot of private support, so that's why you see as many as you do off to the east. And then you'll see some squares with blue dots. Um, those are proposed uh, federal SARS sites. So Scott and I are working to establish these small area artificial reef sites. In federal waters, there'll be one square nautical mile apiece. We'd like to do four of those, and that's in the planning stages right now. So the next one, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the technology at the very beginning. So now you can do really cool stuff where you can make these um, different shapes and designs and those types of things. And I'll let Chantille talk about the next, uh, the Neptune Reef. She visited recently. <laughs> I don't know how much we want to say about it. <laughs> um, we've got we've got some, I'll say grandiose things in store for Bay County. I'm I'm excited to really uplift this community. For a while, the artificial reef program didn't have a lot of momentum, and with this regional project that we did with Walton and Okaloosa, I'm hoping that brings us back up to the forefront. We need it, um, and it would help with with our economy quite a bit. Why is that uh, Neptune's Reef special is what, I guess, when we talk about different types of reefs and everything else? The Neptune Reef is the first of its kind. It's basically an underwater mausoleum. So folks in the community that don't want to do a traditional burial can do something called a green burial, and that allows their remains to go directly into concrete. Um, Neptune Reef has a facility. They partner with uh, one of the funeral homes uh, in 
Palm Beach. I think it's in Palm Beach. Uh, Miami-Dade County overall. But anyways, you can bring your loved one's remains and have it mixed into the concrete. They also invite families to come and put mementos in the concrete. Um, and depending on the type of reef that you purchase with them, if you'd like to have a, a full pillar for your family, you can become a pillar in the Neptune Reef, which is fascinating. There's no other place in the world that has this model. Um, it's modeled after Atlantis, so it's very whimsical to go through. Um, they've got this plotted out in phases. Right now they're on phase two, um, and it's been in the planning process for 20 years. They've got about 33 phases built out for this to be an, a massive underwater park. Um, I had the, the joy of diving on this last May as part of something that Scott and I are kind of working on behind the scenes. So I've got this video put together for you because pictures speak louder than words sometimes. And it's, it's a stunning sight. It's only in about 45 feet of water. You can see the entire structure from the surface of um, from the surface. I don't know if that one's linked. It should play. Okay. We can play that at the very end and see if we can get through and we maybe do apologize. We'll, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> if the video would have worked. No, um, <laughs> we, we do have the video as a backup and we can share it with you as we get through. Okay, no. all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm worried about that. We, we, we do, we did tell you a little bit about the position requirements and so monitoring is a big part of what we do also this is some of the resources that we have uh, dr. Uh, Bill Seaman who used to work with Florida Sea Grant uh, wrote this uh, manual on how we do monitoring so Carrie or any of your students are interested in learning more about artificial reef monitoring and applying uh, scientific uh, principles inside of um, uh, the artificial reef world this is a resource for you and we'd be glad to kind of to kind of help you but again we were looking at all different types of uh, ways to um, take care of that um, we have a couple of things that uh, people can participate in and there's more uh, than this okay um, but the uh, uh, Goliath grouper uh, count is is always on um, but it, there's a certain part as we get into uh, this time of year all on to into uh, May and uh, the summer. Some of the data that we get from volunteer divers that fill out the surveys when they're through uh, with this for this program actually help FWC with the monitoring and also the management of, of Goliath Grouper. And it's an uh, impactful program. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no um, consistent harvest of uh, Goliath Grouper. Um, you know, there, there's those decisions have to be made by these types of observations. As this species uh, starts to recover, then they really have to have that type of data to make those decisions on where, where we're going next and what can be done. And I think Scott can expand on this more. We've seen a massive rebound in the health of our Goliath grouper species. Dr. Angela Collins has come up with this great Goliath grouper count and in limited quantities, FWC is now allowing um, the catch of Goliath grouper, but you've you've got to apply for the permit in order to do that. And they also have, um, you know, locally we have Mexico Beach that kind of serves as the main point of contact in Bay County for uh, Dr. Collins' program. Mm -hmm. These are our Reels to Reef uh, videos. We're going to show these real quick. This is also what I did the second year of the pandemic. I did more reefs. So I don't know if it's, uh, it's going to go or not. Let's see. Ah. That's OK. Yeah, I'm not sure what we got going on. Let's see, try to go backwards real At quick. At the left side instead of the right side of the trackpad. Which one? Just the left side. Oh, for three. Yep. <laughs> but anyway, these are large uh, spools that we had uh, donated from Oceaneering and uh, out at the port. And so we uh, worked with uh, local contractors to get those out. 
These are in Lars A of uh, our area. So in about 100 feet of water, um, we've got, uh, I believe, four of these that are out there right now. And um, we, you know, uh, have other ideas of what else we can put out there in the future, maybe some constructed concrete areas, uh, but we hope to develop that site further as we move, move forward and have more funding. I don't know if this is going to work. This shows you a little bit about what they look like. And again, we're going to be end up just looking at Jeff is what I'm afraid. We wanted to give you an immersive experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we hear bubbles, and so I can't tell if this is what... So he is about to swim through one of the reels, and... Um, what size chunk do you put in those reels? Well, when okay. they were on the... W when they were on that uh, vessel, and Mark A. Towing was our contractor on that, there was so much uh, trips to Mobile to buy the proper amount of uh, things to, to tie everything down. We had to modify the, um, the barge so that uh, we could actually roll these off, and that's what uh, we'll try to show you later on. They were perfect. They, they went straight off, straight down, and landed straight up and down, which is what we wanted to do. Landing sideways takes away some of the complexity of the materials. And these will work down into the sand and be, um, stay there and be really um, something that will last, you know, for decades. And everyone will see later when we pull up the reels video, um, as Scott was talking to some of our engineers, um, these barges have counterweighted ballast, and so the, the water inside just helps to keep it weighted. So as this 65,000 pound bit of material rolls off the end, it's staying as stable as it can. That way it's not tipping over in the So water. they would just pump it full of water and get it where it had an incline once they got on site and um, quite an amazing way to, to figure things out. This is the uh, reef.org survey. The Great American Fish Count is another way that you can be involved in trying to help us with our uh, fisheries. You don't have to be a diver. It, you know, they're talking about any eyes in the water. So if you want to do the jetty and you have a snorkel, you can uh, participate in the program. There are some training resources to help you identify fish and understand what you're looking at and uh, also the materials to record the information. And uh, that's available at reef.org. So those are things that would help us locally too. Oh, they're going to play a video. We have our Florida's Artificial Reef uh, Facebook page, which has a lot of information, the workshops that we were talking about. Uh, we just finished the lionfish one, but before that one, uh, the day before, we had our Northwest Florida Artificial Reef Workshop, which brought together about 75 uh, different uh, experts and individuals to, to share the knowledge of what they know of about artificial reefs in Northwest Florida. And uh, we're working on editing that video right now. I've got closed captioning going on. I know that uh, y'all do that here at your school too. So it takes a, a, a bit of a effort to get all those things together. And uh, we look forward to that. So here's some upcoming stuff and I'll let Chantil talk about them. If I can get things going there. All right, so what's next? It's, uh, it's our snorkel reef project. We're, we're thrilled about this. We've got a, a vendor that's come up from Sarasota to help us pull this together. We've also got Dewberry in the mix, which is fantastic. Um, always supporting local business is great. It's a collaborative project with Destination PC. The Downtown Improvement Board approached us and asked what was feasible in the space. And so immediately we started brainstorming and uh, almost immediately with, with some community commentary. We've heard that a snorkel reef uh, would be a fantastic idea. So we started looking at different areas in the bay and just because we have such a strong family community, it's all, it is all very familial here. Um, we wanted easy access, especially with little ones. We didn't want too much wave action that might be intimidating. And so the Destination PC site offers that. They've already started to re-nourish their beach site um, they're going through the beautification process now, and the vendor that we're working with is going to build out a living seawall. So it's going to be a very dynamic space. 
Um, I've been told personally by the manager over at Hotel Indigo that her staff will bring crab cages in the morning before their shifts and toss it over the side um, so that way they've got a meal to take home in the evenings and this is just going to further support that. Uh, Scott and I have kind of coined it urban sustainability and urban fishery. Um, it's going to help attract um, some of these local fish species, some maybe pinfish, so if you're looking to go out and just cast a line, um, it'll, it'll be great for the community overall. And then we've got some ideas for putting some purpose-driven designs in the center, that way as you're snorkeling or kayaking or stand-up paddle boarding, because they do have the glow paddle board in the evenings, you'll be able to see these structures at night. We, we might see some uh, mangrove snapper, and of course the, then the, my favorite cartoon fish, the blennies. Yes. So. Also, the jackknife fish are about to uh, patch out along that seawall. Mm -hmm. Over the last 50 years, you've huh. little jackknife. Those are cool. It, it's, it reminds you of all the different things that we have in the estuary that use it and call it as home that we maybe associate with the ocean. Um, St. Andrew Bay is absolutely awesome. Well mixed estuary. We want to try to keep it that way. And uh, these projects um, uh, aid in those types of things. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I mean, North Florida overall, we've been cited as having the greatest um, biodiversity in the state. I mean, Key West can argue it, but... Well, we end up with lie. both uh, <laughs> the subtropicals and temperate fishes, right. and then we end up with tropicals in the summertime that migrate in. So mm -hmm. when you add all those together, then that's where you get that really, really rich community. biodiversity. Mm -hmm. With, um, with all of our upcoming projects, the next on board is a 65-foot Swift Ships patrol boat. Um, this is coming from the Withlacoochee and Crystal River, so it's taking a journey to get up here towards, um, towards Bay County. But we have Colleen Marine over in Port St. Joe, where the vessel is currently staged. Scott and I will go do inspection. Um, we did have Keith Milley, our biological administrator, review the vessel um, last year and he said it's pristine. It should take maybe a few weeks to clean up. So Scott and I hope to have this in the water for deployment maybe in the next mm -hmm. two months at most. So we're, we're working with long. FWC and that's who Keith uh, works with. And this will go out in our Lars B site. So simply because of the weight, um, this is a lighter vessel. It's an aluminum frame, aluminum hull. So we're going to deploy it out in about 130 feet of water. And again, we'll uh, use seawater to fill up the tanks. That way that serves as ballast and probably put concrete on the interior on the deck to keep it in place. How did you acquire that boat? Somebody whispered in our ear. Um, and we got a phone call one day asking if we would be interested in acquiring a vessel. And of course, we always are. But funding is really the biggest issue. The, the county will allocate a certain amount for the year. And then we rely either on in-kind donation, uh, private donation, or partnerships to make that happen. With, like in this case, FWC is helping uh, uh, burden the cost along with Bay County. It's more fun if you have dynamite. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but we're, we're not going <laughs> to. I don't think that's going to work on this boat. <laughs> so, um, with our restore project, we have a new site called SARS-M. So if you go to the centroid, to the very center of the reef site, it's about 5.1 nautical miles to the center, about 3.1 to the northeast corner. So this is going to be another near shore site for you. We've got 1,000 tons of concrete going in, uh, which is about 2 million pounds of material. And then we're also working with Man in the Sea. They've got some things that they'd like to deploy in the northern portion. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of those designs. Um, and the southern portion at the deepest, it's going to be up 70 feet or so. So just primarily concrete for the moment, but it's another site. It's our largest small area site. It's a one by one. SARS E through L that Scott had shown you earlier, those we call postage stamp sites. They're just quarter nautical mile sites, quarter uh, by quarter nautical mile sites. And so this is just going to help us pave the way for doing those future sites that I showed you earlier. We can take that same language and replicate it for the ones that we So this will be our closest site to the pass. And so, you know, small <laughs> recreational users that are routinely out can utilize this site safely and easily and access it. And we'll continue to, to build this site in the coming years. You want to show them some of the materials, right? 
I think there's, is there any, there is language here. I don't want to go too far. Is that it? Mm -hmm. All right. So as I mentioned, in SARS-M, we do have the thousand tons of concrete. It's primarily culverts, junction boxes um, of various sizes. It's secondary use concrete. It was donated by Hansen Pipe. Um, and so we're looking to establish nine to 10 patch reef sites. As we mentioned earlier, they'll be about 800 feet or so apart. That way the fishing pressure is relieved on most of them. And then we have phase two of the project coming up. Um, we're finalizing the RFP for phase two now. That will include materials generously donated by the city of Panama City. We've also got the surface, Naval Surface Warfare Center that's donated some materials as well. And then um, additionally, Forget. Heidelberg Materials has donated some concrete too. And we have some other materials left over from oceaneering that we're uh, working on too that are also very sustainable. So look for this to come this summer um, along with some of our other projects. And so this is our uh, reef site and so if you want to take a, a picture of that we're wrapping up here and coming in for a landing. We've got a couple of more slides um, but um, this is a bit.ly site that we can share with you. Um, who do we have it pulled up? I do once we close out. Okay. This, um, this website has been a labor of love since I started with the program a couple years back. We've got all 100 or nearly 800 sites. I believe it's like 764 sites or so in this database. Um, you can do distance from past that's available. It's on a PDF. You can do CSV. I've got KMZ files, GPX. So whichever interface you need to integrate the information into, you're able to now. Um, and we're very happy to provide that to the public and excited to announce it now. And as part of the University of Florida Foundation, we are a partnership with uh, Bay County Board of County Commissioners. And uh, we work uh, on their behalf across all 67 of Florida's counties. And so each county has the ability to collect funds through um, the uh, University of Florida Foundation, which is separate from the university. Uh, but it can be earmarked and money can be donated directly to the Marine Science Program if you're interested in doing that. And so we would uh, be, if you're interested in learning more about that, we'd be happy to talk to you about that too. All right, I think we're to that point so of so questions. Exactly. Yes. yes. So Walton County has 16 beach accessible reefs that you can walk to the beach and accept. Mm -hmm. Walton County has 16 beach accessible reefs that you can go from the beach. It starts in about seven to 10 feet of water and goes out to 25 feet of water. Mm -hmm. So you just put up a QR code for donations. Can we start, like is it 100,000 to deploy a, a dolphin reef or a, a shark image or a turtle? I mean, can we rally to help by getting a reef financed? to put in or is is that something the community can do? One, I can say this, one thing that we're looking at because the TDC, I know this keeps falling, I apologize. The TDC really wants to work with our program. Bay County historically has not had that partnership and our counties to the West do. Um, something that we would really like to focus on is obviously getting these projects in place. And so yes, we, we would happily accept. We would also use that money to leverage it to get grants and find other different sources of funding and not just rely on donations. Donations help us get other funding. What do you estimate, like let's say we did a tur turtle image with off the beach, is it 150,000 or? I would, have to, I would have to look at the 2024 prices provided by Walter Marine because they've got the layer cake design. And then we also have, we have the ability to potentially build some of these structures in house. And that's coming down the line. And there are multiple um, vendors that we would have to price and get, get at. But we're but looking at, you know, I would say in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. The, the TDC does have some borrow areas coming open here soon that they won't be able to borrow from anymore. And those sites are kind of offshore from Panama City Beach and not Panama City, which makes it nice. Um, that will come in time. We communicate with their engineers. And as soon as that information becomes available and we're able to look at it as a permitted area, um, then we can 
kind of delve into it more. Yeah, the ecotourist is a much more valuable tourist for us to attract in our area, yeah. in my humble opinion, and that the snorkel reefs and the reefs are an ecotourist play. Mm -hmm. I just want to know your name. It is Scott Jackson. No, it is not. It is not Scott it is Jackson. Skipper. Skipper Turk. <laughs> Everyone, this is Skipper. I just want to make sure everybody knows. <laughs> I agree. I, I, ecotourism is a wonderful uh, uh, way to promote our livelihood and our marine and maritime industry here. I have a question. I didn't know that amberjacks were attracted to hard bottom or reefs. I always thought of them as being more of a pelagic species that just kind of swims around all the time. Please okay. tell me about that. <laughs> well, the, what she was describing, though, was the actual... I guess appendage it's, on it's top. A, it's a pinnacle, basically. Yeah, it's a, eyes, it's a pole that sticks up into the water column so that it, it does uh, support the uh, okay. uh, amber jacks. Yeah. And so it is a new innovation. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's part of what we learned last week. With, uh, we had presentations from vendors, and I was, it was exciting. I mean, it was, it, it was our family it, to, to learn from. Um, the nice part, and I told them, um, we have these coastal resources coordinators that are working hand in hand across the, the northwest part of Florida. If we have questions and they have questions, they get in contact with us and it's exciting to be able to, to work that way. And I feel the same way about all our mm -hmm. contractors and our vendors and we, that family keeps growing too. So um, there, there is a lot of energy um, as we move forward and, and start to recognize what we're good at in Northwest Florida. Well, and I will say this, coming from South Florida, I've got the mindset that we are one state, we should be one Florida, we should work cohesively, especially with our marine programs. Um, so I've worked really diligently to try and bridge the gap. And so I'm in communication with Miami-Dade's Coastal Resource Coordinator fairly regularly. They've, they're kicking butt and taking names. Um, it's very impressive what Miami is able to do, especially within their barrier island space. And so, again, that's more knowledge that we're able to lean into to try and replicate some of that up here in the north. So I do want to open up the floor to any other, other of our guests that would like to ask questions of our presenters today. <laughs> Good lionfish. Well, yeah, I have a question a over here. We shared in December. Yeah, and we had some some of that during the um, conference too, if I remember right. There were some different things there. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if there are any um, legal protections in place to protect the artificial reefs from being disturbed. Kind of like the coral reefs or something like that. No, the, the artificial ones that you're making. Are there any protections to keep them from being disturbed? I think that's a, it's a catch-22. <laughs> we've, we've heard that some of our nearshore structures um, are moved regularly by trawlers, and I think maybe that's one market that we should try and work with more regularly because that's their livelihood. Um, I know in Okaloosa County, they're kind of working through that process now where they want to put artificial reefs in the base system and have the appropriate protections, as you're saying. But there are a lot of workarounds because in an estuary system where shrimp are collected, um, it, it tends to impede them being able to do their jobs. And so that's something else that we could look at. But I, have, I don't know about Bay County. I would say it, it has to do in the permitting process, mainly where those types of things are put into place and the permit language you know, does kind of say that you must do certain things. One of them is not to move the reefs. You know, We can't help what Mother Nature does. But once the reefs are down and they're located in the prescribed areas that the permit says, which is away from seagrasses and away from hard bottom and those types of things, that probably is the, because you're doing consultations with um, groups like NOAA and some of the other um, different, um, like you were talking about, we've, we've had to consult with the Pilots Association that, that, that um, helped to move cargo in and out of our paths. So there's a lot of different people that have to be consulted when you get the permit. And so um, those communications that occur alongside the, uh, when they give you that piece of paper, before they give you that piece of paper, that's about the the best way that I can think of as far as protection of artificial reefs, that we put them where they're intended to go 
and we have um, the blessing of both the state and the federal government. And I think, I mean, I think too, once material goes down, unless you're a diver with lift bags, the material's not going anywhere unless a storm event moves it. Well, I mainly was concerned with the divers with lift bags who are going to like, you know, take pieces. Cause I've heard that that's a common problem in the diving community that people take pieces of wrecks home with them as like souvenirs. And I just wanted to know that, know if there's anyone that like helps prevent that or if it's just kind of something that we can't really control. I wouldn't say that we can't control it, but those are the things that are specified in that permit. We could look at the permit language and if you know we know of those types of activities, then we can see and work with anybody reporting that to us as to what we could do and what uh, can be done to make sure that they're established is important that those don't move because of you know the animals that uh, accumulate there, the different types of things that are um, growing alongside of not just what's um, the hard structure there, but what's in the um, benthic area and the sands and those types of things too. Well, and the other side of the coin too is that you don't want to fall into over-regulation because FWC and our federal entities are already demonized. So to have an idea that they should be stopping every vessel on the way back in is not the way to look at it either. It, it comes down to your morals and just being honest. If you and know, education. You take, and, and education. Yeah. If you're with someone who's taken something, it's, you know, you're also accountable for telling them, put it back. We can think of other examples. Um, Follow-up question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that if you have a ship that you're going to sink and it has hazardous material like... Um, asbestos you mentioned you just paint over it would that paint not just degrade in the water well it, asbestos and P, uh, PCBs are two separate different things um, asbestos is the insulation material that is meant to um, address like heat usually we find these on some of the other parts and stuff and sometimes it's actually a fire barrier mm -hmm. and so the the main problem that we have with that is when we're preparing boats and those types of things if people are cutting on that, that could enter their lungs and it could cause cancer. And so it's better not to do anything with that except for to, to if there's an area that is frayed or um, crumbling or falling apart that could produce like um, any type of dust, that that is uh, covered over with, with just paint. Now the other materials, we, we're required to move all types of petroleum, oils, diesel fuel, um, any number of, you know, uh, transmission fluids, I any of the coolants on the motors and all that stuff, all that stuff gets cleaned out and gets removed. Um, you know, the example, specific example for the risk and need was a, just a specific case on PCBs and those are limited mainly to older things that are made before 1950. And so we don't see a lot of that and we just got through doing a, a test on a recent vessel that we were looking at and it came back negative. And so we, we didn't anticipate that would happen, but we prepared and, you know, we, we took stuff from everywhere. You know, we were, we were trying to, you know, if it was gonna mess up, we wanna know about it so that we can address it right now. Um, and if it costs us extra money, it costs us extra money. And so that's the way we kind of look at those types of things. And there's, there's a whole document prescribed by the EPA, um, part of what Chantille was talking about with the uh, risk and need, that's where the document came from. I didn't know that until we went to the program last week. I didn't know that's where it came from. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. knew that it was like, like that thick. <laughs> yeah. it, it is, it's almost 300 pages, but it's, it's worth reading if you're interested. It, it, it is worth reading if you're interested too. It gives you an, an idea of what goes on. It's just that I think, you know, in our community, we're committed to making sure that what goes down is clean and ready to go. We have another question. I know that the city of Panama City is going through a very large infrastructure replacement program, and so I know they're removing a great many uh, concrete culverts, collection boxes, pipe, things like that. Is it cost effective to try to repurpose that in a reef or is there an issue of inspecting it and cleaning it? Is it just more cost effective to go with clean concrete, uh, something purpose built or the pipe that's been 
not approved for use, but it's just out of the castings, or how does that work? Is old concrete worth? You want to try it? It, it, it is. Um, often, well, and actually, as of 2024, um, the, the mixture for which, or by which concrete is being produced um, has to be more carbon neutral and eco-friendly. So up until the end of 2023, concrete standards went by what was established in the 1980s when we went through this whole ecological reformation. And so our contractors were able to guarantee a shelf life, if you will, for the purpose-built structures to last between 300 and 500 years. Um, things have changed significantly. The U.S. is trying to go more green. And so now concrete with this new standardization has uh, about 150 year shelf life. And it's out of our control. So when we are able to get these older materials, um, it lasts longer, we know that. The concrete that is cast now has to typically sit out for a minimum of one year to desiccate. You don't want anything leaching into the water column. And now that we know anything, and you can also look at the color that was pointed out by one of our contractors. There's a significant, uh, significant difference in color with the new materials versus old. Um, the older, more grade concrete um, helps organism encrusts a little bit better, uh, just because of the surface texture as well. That's changed so with the aggregate, but we'll we'll see what happens. If if anyone would like to donate. We're yeah, open. And I would say it comes down to economics and, and, and what's available. A lot of that concrete can be crushed, crushed and used as road base and recycled and so that's a good use for it too. Um, I, I like engineered concrete for artificial reefs mm -hmm. and that is my preferred amount. It's kind of like saying I like Mercedes over a Volkswagen or you know a Beetle or something or you know uh, I don't know just that that is what I prefer because it's made for that uh, with all the different types of uh, thought that goes into that and as it's continually uh, developed and we reap the benefits of that it's, it's exciting to see those those types of things I, I think we would not say no to a concrete project just because it's old concrete or something like that but we'd have to look at the amount of time you hit the nail on the head when you said the cost of preparation and mm -hmm. um, some of our costs that we have right now are, are actually putting it on a truck and then getting it to the waterfront that's a that's a large expense and so um, so it really just depends on where the concrete is and, uh, and who, who's helping us with the with the cost of that where it's come from we had um, the potential last year and it didn't and that's okay it didn't happen but um, if we were to get something that was already pre-submerged it's got organisms on it already that's a benefit if we don't have to mm -hmm. do any sort of prep at that point um, just finding a staging site is one of our, our biggest if it's on the waterfront and it's you know fairly uniformed and it's been in the water already that's a no-brainer we would take that if the timing works if the yes timing if the timing works, works. we're not <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a, a community effort. Um, Panama City has been, played an integral part in helping us through the restore process because the county, with the thousand tons of material, they've had it for about ten years. Um, and then the artificial reef program lost its permitting for a little while, and they weren't able to deploy where they needed to with the materials. So when I was hired, we got SARS-M established in eight months. Army Corps moved pretty swiftly on it, which was nice. Um, and now we've got some other materials because of this community effort from the Naval Base um, through collaborative effort. Panama City had uh, reached out to Heidelberg Materials, so we have some other culverts going down. And it, it does take that. When uh, somebody had asked me how we acquired this vessel down in with Lacucci, it was as simple as a phone call. Is this something you're able to do? Um, for larger vessels, Scott and I are really looking to partner more with our TDC. We'd like that additional support so we can build out larger projects for the region. And with the FWC. And with they, FWC. And, they, and they, they have some additional funding that we're tapped into and we enjoy working with them. Mm -hmm. And we do have one more question back here. 
Um, I had a question of how do you or have you designed any of these reefs for protection from storm surge or flooding or or is it just purely for economical or fishing fishery um, and habitat recreation yeah I, I had that question actually online last week when I was moderating that and um, one of the things that we showed you just a second ago was a little bit of the the living seawall type kinds of things those are integral parts of living shorelines too so you get the living seawall and the reason the living part I guess comes from the strategy of, of trying to do something along the shoreline to mitigate erosion and those types of things. This seawall should uh, uh, buffer uh, any wave action against that wall and then reduce some of the erosion, which then will allow the plants to grow and the seagrasses to grow and then address some of the pollution control and some of the other stuff. Yes, we'll get fish out of this. We'll get the opportunity to, to go out and swim near those areas or go fishing near those areas, but it also is providing those benefits that you described to erosion control and therefore, you know, potentially coastal flooding. I wouldn't say stormwater, you know, running off of the land flooding. I'm talking about, you know, coastal flooding where you can break up the wave energy with the plants and those types of things. Those are the benefits that you would see. Um, I also had a question of cultivating uh, certain sponges or corals on the actual reefs themselves, um, like working with a biologist or um, some other ist, uh, obviously. <laughs> um, and to like reduce turbidity in certain waters, like you said at the beginning, I, I was listening where a lot of times you said that you don't go to certain places or you don't go to certain sites just based on turbidity. Um, because you can't monitor them, um, or that the turbidity gets worse, and so monitoring becomes tougher. So, mm -hmm. so I think that there's a couple parts. You want to take the coral part planning, and I'll take the sponges if you want. I have some experience <laughs> with that. We um, we've definitely spoken to the TDC about it. Um, when I went down to do the Neptune Reef survey dive, just to see what they've got going on in the south. Um, it's it's different. We have just cold, deep water, and we're we're not the tropics. And what it comes down to is we can't readily do coral gardens up here as much as I think we would all like to have that happen. It's just it does not sustain the conditions that they need to survive. Um, we could get into a slew of other things, but I'll just keep it simple. Right now, that's not an option. There is one vendor who has suggested one species being able to thrive this far north within the Gulf. And uh, it may be something we can look at in the future, but for right now, it's just not feasible. And so they're um, part of a class that we do with the Florida Master Naturalist Program with marine restoration. I was able to go out in the Keys um, and work with FWC on their sponge restoration project. And it's a matter of just cutting pieces of sponge and. Uh, strapping them to, you know, uh, hard substrate. In this case, it was just like some big uh, brick blocks that uh, went down. So they would harvest the sponges and then they would cut them into uh, different segments and then allow those to regenerate and repopulate the sponge area um, that they had targeted. We don't see that in our area just yet, but the technology's there. It's worked out and it's worked pretty good. And so I, I, I'm going to echo what she said, that um, we probably don't have as uh, big of a barrier to sponges as what we might to, to coral. Um, so it might be something that we look at in the future, especially if we can come into that. A lot of, a lot of what we end up with is just... Smaller Gorgonian species, hard corals. We don't, we just, soft corals mm -hmm. don't survive here. Maybe in 10 years they could. I was thinking about just turbidity in general, and uh, I really would just encourage people to pay attention to stormwater and little things like how I use my recycled water on my lawn is really, really important to our bay. And um, when when that only costs you know thirteen dollars a a month for however much water you want to put on your lawn, when we get 
10 or uh, you know nine or ten inches of rainfall in in August or in uh, July all that water goes right into the retention ponds that are full of I, what I see is re recycled water in my neighborhood mm -hmm. and it goes right out into the bayou and there's this fresh water outflows that really cause a lot of problems um, for turbidity and some of the things that, that show up in our water systems. There is another group that I'm a big fan of. It's, uh, we have one of the people that is here from Florida State and it's the San Andrew Bay Estuary Committee in St. Joseph Bay and San Andrew Bay. And that is another way to mm -hmm. specifically address our estuary community and uh, doing a lot of good things. So to be able to join that is a, a good ancillary. Mm -hmm. No, to them. enjoy the, the different nonprofits and, and take care of the stuff, but also just understanding and helping your neighbors understand. Um, don't underestimate what can be done on the land for the, for the water. That weed and feed and right. is running right into that And we have really great answers at our office. Uh, <laughs> so come to the extension office and we have a, a group of master gardeners and some of them are here helping us tonight. So. Uh, come visit us. We'd love to talk to you more about how you can be successful in your yard so we don't mess up the bay. Right. That's right, guys. Um, IFAS and our county extension agents have a, many, many resources for you, whether you are on the land, in the water. And thank you very much for bringing up the St. Joe and St. Andrew Bay Estuaries Program. I do want to give a shout out to them for doing a lot of amazing work um, here on our estuaries. I don't mean to cut off any questions. I am going to just take a pause. I want to definitely give you guys an opportunity to play that awesome video and to field <laughs> any other questions that are going to come your way. But I want to hand the mic over for just a second to the Panhandle Gator Club okay. who brought us refreshments tonight. And I'm a gator. She's a gator. Mm -hmm. Aren't you want, don't you want to be a gator too? Yeah, mm -hmm. right? Now I want to hand this over to Rob because I want, that's right, chomp chomp. <laughs> And you guys are going to come back up. I'll be short, but as a certified diver for 52 years and an avid fisherman, this program is awesome. And I thank you. everything y'all are doing. Thanks, so. I appreciate that. Beverages and refreshments are outside. If you didn't get something, please grab something on your way out. Uh, I don't think I can eat that many cookies. And my grandchildren don't need them. So... Uh, please grab something on your way out. We're more than happy to sponsor this. The Panhandle Gator Club is an organization where gators uh, socialize. And when I say gators, it doesn't mean you have to be an alumni. You can be a friend of the gator. You can even be from another university. It doesn't matter to us. We love anybody. So I want to make two points. One, you don't have to be alumni to be part of Gator Club. Secondly, we don't just do athletic events. Most people think these alumni associations, any of them, just do football viewing. As you can see tonight, we're sponsoring the refreshments for here. March 9th, we have a, a social at the Dublin Winery. Uh, March 20th, we have a bowling social. We have something every month. We're a very family-oriented organization. If you're interested, I'll be glad to talk with you. Thanks. Welcome, welcome. Yes, thank you, Rob. Absolutely. If anyone is interested in information from uh, IFAS, Bay County, or from Panhandle Gator Club, make sure um, that when you, well, maybe you already have signed in, but have sign-in sheets over here. I've got sign-in sheets over on the ends of these uh, tables here. Be sure to give your email address, and I can happily share that information with you. Are there any other questions this evening on our reefs for the real world? Yeah, right. yeah let's watch it. All right, it's beautiful. If you get a chance, you really should go down, even if for a weekend. Really. On all of the structures that you see here at Neptune, every piece of the reef is a memorial from the end caps at the top to the arches, um, the arm uh, in between each of the structures are all remnants of somebody at some point in time. They've got a really unique brass copper alloy mix that's used for family plaques. Um, 
so I'll let you take a look. The holes are empty spaces where they can put canisters. And then along the bottom if you want it to be a seashell or a sea turtle, there's an option for that too. And they cement it uh, to the bottom. I would imagine that's a well-visited site and pretty cleaned up. As you can see, the entirety of this structure is all human remnants. It's fascinating because you're, you're giving back to the ocean. It's feeding off the biological material. That's it. If you go off of Biscayne Bay, you know, Miami has the, it's right in the shallows. You're less than three miles going out. So our office is at uh, 2728 East 14th Street, which is right behind Cedar Grove Elementary School. If you're ever in our area, uh, don't be afraid to stop by and say hello. Thank you all so much. The dive? <laughs> well, no, no, no. Like, if the what's the cost of the of the uh, burial? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh well. So if you if you saw at the bottom, there were some what looked like the stones that you might put out in your garden. They do lower relief. Those might be two or three thousand, maybe upwards of five. I think with inflation now, um, so it's fairly inexpensive compared to a traditional burial. Um, they do. So they, what they do, they have a refrigeration unit and you bring your remains to the site, you sign waivers. Like I said, they operate through a funeral home, so everything is... Legal. Know, legal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not in anyone's backyard, but... Right. Say it again now? There's nothing like that down in the Everglades. No, this, no, this is the only project of its kind in the world. That's it. It, Very innovative. Yeah. It is. It is. So, and it, I um, mean, it's stunning, too. You can see that life is giving back. So they call it life after life. When you look at their model on the website, that's how they market this. It's very awesome. And so I am going to let you guys know they're not going anywhere. If you have any questions, please stick around and ask. The, only, the last thing I'm going to say is that we do have one more citizen science coming up in March. It's going to be on March the 12th, and St. Andrew Baywatch will be here presenting. So thanks so much for coming, y'all. Have a great evening. Thank you.